So here is a nine gram hobby servo. We use these things all the time. The idea with these is that you give them power like any old motor, and then there's a signal wire that you send a PWM pulse varying between 1000 microseconds and 2000 microseconds, and the shaft will turn somewhere between, you know, one and 180 degrees, zero and 180 degrees. So what I'd like to prove out today is that this is actually happening and we don't actually need an RC receiver, an Arduino or a flight control board in order to do that. We can just provide it a pulse with some of the various equipment we have here. So to make our test a little bit easier, I've got a little proto board here that I've soldered on a three pin header and then wired together to that the three test pins that you see right here. These ones, if you, if you notice how they look here, they got little eyelets on them. They make it really easy to hook your little uh, grabbers, your little mini grabbers too. So what we'll end up doing is we'll take our servo, we'll plug it into the three pin header, hook up all of our test equipment, and then we'll see if we can get this thing to move. Now, the test equipment that you see in front of us is a signal generator that's going to be used to provide the PWM pulse, the oscilloscope down here to prove out what this is doing, and then a bench power supply to provide the main power for the motor itself. Okay, we'll plug in the function generator first, and we wanna get it probably at least reasonably, you know, where it's supposed to be so we don't hurt anything. So we're gonna to go to a square wave. We're on channel one. Channel one's over here. It's kind of weird the way they set this up, I think. Um, and what is the main pulse width? What's the frequency gonna be right here? Right now we've got it at one kilohertz. So you can move some stuff around here like this, but what you really wanna do is you just wanna come in here and you type 50 and then you can say, okay, it's 50 hertz. So 50 hertz, translates if you do the math one divided by 50 is you're going to end up with 20 milliseconds so the overall timing of the cycle will be 20 milliseconds from from peak to peak this part that's going to be right in here that's classically called the duty cycle we're going to change that into milliseconds so we're going to do something else in just a second but for now i want to set this up just to show you what's going on okay so we've got a 50 hertz signal we have an amplitude of four volts peak to peak so this is kind of different if you want to see it as just all solid dc then what you'll want to do is basically cut this down by half and change the offset that sounds crazy right now but that will make sense in just a second so i've got this set up to use the cursors you could go by the divisions on the screen here and you can see that basically you know we're somewhere close to four volts per division per what i said but what you can also do is you can come down here and you can grab these different cursors and I've, since i've got them all set up i i don't know if it's ever easier to do it this way or not but if you long press them i can move them around and so then i should get to the next one i could bring this down and then what you'll see here is if i just move this up and down you're going to see the delta right, of the Y, so that's the difference between the two, and if I get it roughly on here, it's gonna show you that I've got a delta of four volts peak to peak. If you wangle this around a little bit more, it will show you, well, you don't have to wangle it to do this, but um, it shows you where is the position of this, and you see that if I, again, I get kind of right on there, I'm two volts below zero, so that's, again, the peak to peak that we're seeing. So if I were to go over to the other one and bring the offset up so that this is on zero, then the peak to peak over there will still be four volts peak to peak, but it'll have a two volt offset. I know, I know, I know, this is crazy. Let's go over to the other one and I'll show you what the hell I'm talking about. All right, so here's the offset that I was talking about. Here is the four volts peak to peak. So if I were to go down over here to my offset, right there, and I change the offset from zero to two, uh, actually here I'm gonna write two because you see that's in millivolts right there. So if I say two, then I can come in here and I can say, you know, volts DC. So now we're at two volts. So it'll push that whole thing up two volts, which means it'll still be four volts peak to peak. So if we go back to the oscilloscope, then what you're going to see is two volts offset up, but now there will be a four volt positive. Before what we're seeing was two volts down below, two volts above zero. So it's throwing back and forth. Now we're gonna see solidly four volts over it up at the top. 
and this here is what I was talking about. So now if I go ahead and, and we're move this cursor back up to here, the Y value is going to be right at zero. So there's our zero volts and I'll long press it. Then I bring this one up and now this is roughly at, you know, if I dial it in, if you zoom in, you'll get better accuracy with your cursors, but it's proving out that it is four volts peak to peak. This is a lot, a lot of information. This is a lot of information to, to grab a hold of right now just for a servo test, but it's the setup to understand what is going on when we get to the test. So it is four volts peak to peak with a two volt offset. So what we're seeing in the scope is a pulse of zero to four volts. That's really all we wanted to see. Now, I will reach over to the signal generator, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the amplitude from four to five. So when I turn this, we'll see this jump up to five volts, except we're gonna see the whole thing kind of shift down a little bit as well because we only have a two volt offset. So you see what happens? That's five volts, that's four volts. Five volts peak to peak. So five volts up to here, but we drop down half a volt down below or so, so we need to bring this offset back up. So if I'm currently at five volts, this value, this offset here is going to have to be 2.5 to get it to be where I want it to be. And now again, everything is spot on. So we've got, this is at zero, that's up a little bit. So if we move our cursor up there, we'll see that we have now got our kind of sort of requisite five volts. I can tell you that we actually don't need five volts to get this thing to function. It will change a little bit on how its function is and how much, much uh, energy, torque, power it has to, to move from one side to the other, but this will be good for our test. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is change the duty cycle. So over here is the duty cycle and it's in a percentage. I can also tell you with this in the square wave function right here, it's not gonna go below 20%. So it's not really what we want, but I wanna show you that if I change this right here, you see that shrinks down it. If you can hear that, it's beeping at me. It says, no, you can't do this. So the effect here by increasing the duty cycle is the amount of overall usable power that you end up having. And if you have capacitance on there or you know, a capacitor on the end there, end there, you can take something like a higher voltage, for example, maybe a 10 volts. And if you pulse it the certain, a certain way out the other end, you might get, instead of 12 volts, you might end up getting five volts instead because of the 50% duty cycle. And if you lower it down even more, then maybe you get you know, five volts, three volts, two volts or whatever. And so it's been a very effective way at driving things like motors, like a DC motor, that plain regular old DC motor that takes just energy. It doesn't you need to have an electronic speed controller or a motor driver in order to function you can um, give it a voltage and it'll spin. But if you give it more voltage, it will spin faster and slower depending upon what you do to it. So if you have uh, PWM, as in like an Arduino, you can use that to pulse the signal of a constant voltage to try to get a lower voltage over at the other side, okay? So that's, that's kind of the theory behind that. Now, in order to get this to work the way that we want it to though, since I can't go below 20%, and if you figure out the math to figure out what 20% is, it's not nearly what we want for the uh, one to two milliseconds or 1,000 to 2,000 microseconds. It's not gonna get me what I want. So I have to go over here to pulse. So I change it to pulse and there is the pulse. And it says that it's currently at 200 microseconds and we're still at 50 hertz, five volt peak to peak with a 2.5 volt offset. So everything looks great, looks the same, but we've just effectively skinnied up our pulse. So let's take a look at that. So you can barely see it there, but there is that little sliver and we could zoom in if we want to, but the more you zoom in, the, the more of the, the rest of it that's gonna run off the page there, maybe you don't wanna have that because if I increase this too much, then you gotta shift things over. But if I, this is probably a pretty decent zoom level. You can see that this right here is just a little skinny sliver compared to what it was before. So let me get my cursor over to this one. Let's see what the delta of the X is. So X1, this cursor right here is at zero. X2 is currently at 0.55 milliseconds or 550 microseconds. So I'm gonna take this one and move it over that way. Okay, so then I move this one over about as close as I can get it. And if I get it to where, again, if you zoom in, you get a little bit better accuracy, but I was able to kind of, yeah, that looks right on it. And I've got 0.2 milliseconds. I think I said 20 milliseconds a second ago, but it's 0.2 milliseconds or 200 microseconds, right? So that 
is what we have set right here. So there's our 200 microseconds. So if I go to the width of this and I start messing around with that, then I will be able to change the width of that pulse. So I will change this here. Let's go over to the other screen and check it out. Okay, 200 microseconds going to 300, 400, 500, 600, and you can see the width is getting larger. So a lot of setup, but that's the idea behind PWM and getting our pulse width the right way in order to control our servo here. So then the next thing to do is get over back over to the signal generator and change it, change this, this pulse width right here to the requisite 1000 to 2000 microseconds before we plug it into the servo. If I were to plug this into the servo now, what would end up happening is that the motor here will try to turn to this location. The pulse width of this is sending information to a controller inside here. So that's probably the first part of the mystery of a servo. There are electronics in here and they receive a signal and then they move the motor to a certain position. They get that position by way of some type of a sensor, which is almost always in this case going to be a potentiometer. If I were to send it this pulse right here, it will potentially break this. You'll definitely strip some gears. Now this is one side, 2000 will send it all the way over to the other side, usually the max throw of the servo. So to be on the safe side, what I'm going to do is knock it down to 1.5 milliseconds. 1500 microseconds. By the way, the reason I keep saying this back and forth, if you're looking at a piece of test equipment like this, you're probably going to be looking at it in something like, like lower numbers. It's not going to list it out as 1500 microseconds. It's 1.5 milliseconds now. If I start dropping below, then it shifts over into microseconds. On our drones, in our flight control boards, in the documentation for the receivers for a lot of the different RC vehicles that we run, they will say that this value is 1500 microseconds, except they just usually say 1500, they say 1000, they say 2000, they don't qualify it with this, and I feel that a lot of people will say 1500 milliseconds when it's really 1500 microseconds is what we're looking for. And then if we look back at our oscilloscope here, we see that we have a, a width that's much wider than it was. Wide enough that I feel that I could probably lower this down a bit and I can move my cursor over now to measure that. And we should be right at you know, 1.48, yeah, I could nudge there, 1.5 milliseconds. Okay, let's get our board hooked up. All right, so this is basically the same thing we had before. We've got our signal coming in, going to the oscilloscope probe here so we can read it. The grounds are tied together, and now we've got the addition of the servo right here. This is for our main power input, and we'll tie that to ground as well. So that's why I've got these probes, and we'll go ahead and plug it into our bench power supply. Okay, so these are fabulous devices. They have some really cheap bench power supplies out there. Uh, 30 bucks, 50 bucks. This one here is... 350 something like that it's substantially more ex expensive but uh, you know check the amount of current that you can put out of it and the fact that I could do a lot more things with this is really nice I've got two channels here so I've got channel one channel two I'm plugging into channel one and currently I'm going to set it at three volts this uh, motor is spec'd at five volts most of the time if you were to look up uh, how much power it requires it'll say something like five volts or up to five volts. From previous experiments, three volts is just fine. I will change this later to show you what that does. The next thing you have the ability to do is you can change how much current will be allowed to go to your device. So this is a half an amp. That's, that's still enough to pretty much kill the device, but it maybe won't start a fire. I could probably knock this down even more. So this is the, the, the great thing about this. You guys that do uh, drones or work on different RC uh, devices and you've heard of a thing called a smoke stopper, a much better thing would be able to have a bench power supply that you could actually limit the current. You find out how much current it actually needs, you supply just that amount of current, and if it wants to go over that, it will not let it. Uh, you give it maybe a little bit extra headroom so you can see that it's trying to do that, and then you know that you can kill the device, you know, turn it off before you, you know, ruin it more, I guess. 
So we'll go ahead and we'll take our leads and we'll hook them up uh, to the board. When you make little proto boards like this, if you know you're going to be hooking up a lot of different things in the same area, you might decide to supply yourself with a lot of extra test pins that all go to say ground or signal. So our test fixture here is all done so we can kind of slide this off to the side and then we can focus on the servo. So the next thing to do then is to actually apply power to the bench power supply out its input and turn on the signal. So let's take a look at that. When looking at both of these devices, pretty much anything that can do some type of an output, what it usually should at least do, by the way, the cheaper bench power supplies don't do this, you turn the device on, you change your settings, and then you apply output, you see? So if you happen to be using something that did not have that capability, you would have to know to disconnect all those things that I just hooked up, set your settings, and then you know and then plug it in because it's actually live all the time so when i hit this button we'll now get power to the motor over here when i hit this we'll then begin sending the pwm pulse to the signal line of the motor so then finally i think we're to the end of this where we can get to testing the device whenever it comes to doing things like this when you're trying to figure out some level of first principles on how something operates it seems that the test fixture the setup of the the situation to test this is always much more involved than the actual test itself so hopefully your desire for knowledge will compensate for that complication I can tell you that it took me quite a bit of time just to hook up all the devices here on the damn bench so that I could film them. Then what I'll do first is I'll turn on the signal. So we turn the signal on and then we can see now the oscilloscope is still working. We, we hooked it up right, everything's functioning as it should be, but the uh, motor didn't move. It is possible that from the last time I operated this that it's sitting right at 1500 still, but I really doubt that's the case. So now I'll reach over and I'll turn on the output of the bench power supply and we'll see if that causes any effect. There you go. So that little movement right there brought it to center, which is right about there. So then what I'm going to do is go back over to the signal generator and change that PWM pulse and we should see that move. So we're at 1500. I'm going to go to 1600. You see it move back and forth and back and forth and then look up at the pulse there. You can see that that is changing as well. Hear that crunch? Can you hear that little crunch? I don't know. I went a little bit too far. I exceeded 2000 and I kind of stripped the gears a little bit. Oopsie. Now the other thing we can do with this is I can go ahead and I can change the voltage. So once you set up a situation like this, we proved out, we proved out the principle. Changing the millisecond pulse width of our PWM signal will get this to move. Now what I can also do is I can vary the amount of power to things. And why would I wanna do this? Well, maybe it gets more torque. We, of course, maybe we care about that, but maybe it doesn't do anything differently and we're just burning up uh, needless energy. And so I'm constantly, by the way, feeling this to see if it's getting hot. So I'm gonna go over to the bench power supply and I'm gonna change the voltage from three volts to two volts. And now I'm going to change the pulse and see if that has any effect. Can you see this changing? This isn't doing anything. So right away, I figured out that two volts is not enough, but I'll put it back up to three volts and now it functions. So three volts, somewhere between two and three is the value that it absolutely needs to function. But now what happens if I go up higher? So now I'm at five volts and I move it. And this, you'd actually have to possibly feel this in your hand. It's moving <laughs> with more gusto. It's, it's, it's got a, a bit more energy behind it. Is this going to cause a problem? Maybe. If you don't care about blowing one of these things up, they're pretty darn cheap. You could keep increasing that to see how much it could actually handle. Of course, we could read the spec sheet, but that's not why we're here. We're here to test out, prove out that all those things that we read and, and have heard are actually true. Since we're here, we might as well play with a couple more things though. The 50 
hertz signal. I want to show you what that looks like. And I want to show you some things that, you know, you kind of might figure out as you play around with this. The 50 hertz signal is not necessarily a mandate. It was a thing that was agreed on many years ago, many, many years ago, and along with the pulse itself. It could possibly work or, you know, to your benefit or not, you know, if you change this. So here we are at 50 hertz. I've zoomed it out a little bit so we can see the signal scroll across the screen. We're looking at peak to peak our 50 hertz signal and inside there the little slivers are the pulse width that we've set. Now, if I change the frequency from 50 down to say 40, 30, 20, you're going to see that change. So now I'm, I'm at 50, I'll just keep scrolling down, 49, 48, I'll, I'll just crank it down a little bit, we're at like a 38. And so now it's at 38 times per second, 38 hertz. So you're going to see the time that it takes to generate another one of the pulse widths get longer. So I don't know if you can tell here, I'll just crank it down a little bit. They're getting a little bit wider. Now I'm down at 19 hertz, they're much wider. So the same thing if I crank it all the way back up, I'll get back up to 50. Uh, every so often this twitches a little bit just because we, we caught the edge of it somewhere where it's supposed to be. Uh, we're down at 50 again. Okay, so now what I want to show you is I'm going to bring it back down to, uh, let's say, 40. So now we're at 40 hertz, peak to peak. The standard again is 50. So I'll go down and I will change the milliseconds now from one, it's currently at one uh, millisecond or, you know, 1,000 microseconds. Will this still function at 40 hertz? So I'm bringing it up and it works just fine, you see? So I can bring that up and I could drop it down. Did I find out something really super interesting that nobody knows about? No, but you know, it's good to play with this stuff so then you know where your boundaries are. Like what we saw a moment ago where I now know with this particular servo, if I get lower than two volts, it's just not going to function. Now you also have another question that you can ask the internet out there and say, well, why does this work? And you might find you know, that it has something to do with the older standard and maybe I wanted to fit more pulses from different devices in that certain period of time. That's a thing that happens quite frequently as well. So yes, as a matter of fact, you can send a pulse, a small short pulse width to a servo motor and you can get it to actually move. So that information itself, it proves out what we know or maybe we've read about a servo motor, but it also gives us information to create our own types of controllers. There are little chips out there that are strictly PWM uh, devices to govern this type of behavior and knowing this you could now go find the right one to get it to perform your function without let's say an Arduino or a, a receiver possibly. There is one last thing I want to show you since we have this all set up. Over on a function generator there is a modulate button and I can hit this and it will cause this to sway by a predefined value. So watch this. So now you get this motion but you can also see it right up there. And this is really nice because now that it's moving on its own, I can go around and I can change other types of variables as well. So I can go over to say, for example, the bench power supply. And let's, it's, it's currently at, here it was at four volts, but now we're up at five volts. So watch this value right here, we're at five volts and we'll knock it down a little bit at a time. And as we lower the voltage, you see that eventually it cuts off. We're currently at 1.6. So if I bring this up a little bit more, 2.2 volts, and it just spazzed out on me. So I get back to 2.7 and we're moving again. What you'll notice with this is that the speed itself doesn't really change. And so this opens up um, a lot more possibilities for testing. If I move it up more, you guys can't quite tell this, but as I bring the voltage up, I can feel that the, the force of this is a lot more uh, pronounced, but the speed isn't changing. So think about that for a second. It's getting a signal from somewhere else saying to go to this location. It's not just give it power and it goes, like a typical DC motor, if you give it less, then it's just going to move a little bit slower. At even a lower voltage, it is doing its best to try to get to that location as it moves back and forth. Uh, when I increase the voltage, it again will just do it with a little bit more gusto. But now, watch this. So we change over here to our current and we look down here. We got point, 
8.9 or so. Let, let's bring that up a little bit more. So the way this works is this is your current cutoff. So it's going to keep this device from pulling anything more if it tries to exceed that value. But even at, under its normal operation, it's not going any higher than I see, you know, 0 0.1 there. Okay. So I could easily uh, lower this down to 0.11 and it'll still be operating normally. But if I start to drop this down further, under 10, I can feel something happened. But let's let's get this looking at you guys here. Eight, seven. So now look at this. It's seemingly moving slower, but it's basically not able to do its job any longer. So the pulses that are coming out saying, hey, I need you to move over to here, I need you to move over here, it doesn't have the oomph in it to get it there. What's the oomph? The oomph is the current flow that flows through the wire, through the coils, charges the coils up, makes a magnet, and causes a motor to move. If I can't get that current flow, the voltage isn't going to help me. I need the current flow. So it's being restricted. So it is uh, not slowing down. It's basically not getting to where it's supposed to go in time before the next pulse arrives. So if I start to drop this down even more, it's hardly doing anything. So if I go ahead and move this back up, as soon as I get past point 0.1, we've got the requisite current flow. I can crank this up for days. This is not increasing the current. This is saying at which point will it clamp down and say I will not allow any long any more. And due to internal ESRs of the whole entire device here th and, and the burn off of the motor, this is all that it needs. It's, it, it's not taking any more than maybe point 0.1, 0.09, point 0.1. So as usual, I hope that was interesting to you guys out there. Incidentally, what brought this about is a new build that I'm working on, a new drone build. And this is a, uh, a bit more autonomous. It's running iNav. So if you're familiar with this world, it is a type of firmware that is uh, can be uh, fairly autonomous. You can do GPS waypoints, you can do GPS hold and, and things of that nature, but you can still fly FPV with it if you want. So it seems to be kind of a well-rounded middle of the road uh, firmware. Well, I wanted to add some servos onto the build for either camera tilting or actually a grabby claw, because you know, all drones need to have a grabby claw. And the idea would be then uh, to hook this up to some of the existing motor pads, but the motor pads on drone flight control boards have a certain timer, and the timer cannot be changed on certain pads because they, well, you can change them, but they go for all the pads that are there, so it would mess up the motors. However, the one that we're looking at, there are uh, eight pads, There's it's could be used for an octocopter and there's a couple pads seven and eight that could be used for servos and you could change the timer what would you change the timer to well 50 hertz because that's what servos need to have and so that's what brought this about so anyways again i hope you found this interesting and i will get back to all my other uh, typical strangeness